So we are here today to talk about a number of things. I'm excited because we're friends and we've talked a lot. But we've actually never gotten to sit down and do an interview like this. So I'm super excited. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Been looking forward to it for a while, actually, because I know we've tried a few times. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's dig right into your film. You've got a new movie that is hitting the theaters. It's called Pursuit of Freedom. And I have to tell you, this movie, what it's about, what it stands for, especially at the times we're in now, is incredibly pertinent and powerful. What can you tell us about this film? Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. It does deal with a story that's based on true characters. Um, their identities had to be hidden in order to protect them. It's based on the true story of an Armenian woman who was trafficked out of Ukraine by Russian gangsters, sold into slavery with her children. Um, these missionaries who were in Armenia at the time happened to find out about it, ironically, from a pastor in the U.S., and they set out on a mission to try rescue her, having to deal with bureaucratic red tape in very tumultuous countries, and then obviously putting their own lives on the line. What has it been like? I mean, here you are, you're in this film, you star in it, you're promoting this movie at a time where Ukraine and Russia are obviously in the headlines for very tragic reasons. What has that been like, that dynamic? It has been fascinating because I had a conversation with our trafficking partner, Hope for Justice International, which is essentially a faith-based organization similar to Operation Mobilization that heads into countries to fight slavery. My conversation with the woman on the phone who heads up their ministry that partnered with us, it was tough not to get emotional. She said, because all the men stayed behind to fight, it was essentially the elderly, but mostly women and children who were escaping via every border option that they could before they even got to the border and before Hope for Justice could even get volunteers on the ground. These women and children were already being approached by people who seem to have good intentions. Here where you can get, here's where you can get water. We can't believe what you're going through. Here's a couple of places you can stay. Let us take care of you. We can help you and your children. A lot of them did, did not have the capability to be able to deduce who was fake and who was real. Some of them got trafficked. So Hope for Justice got on the ground. They now stand there with a board that literally is next to them and says, only listen to people with the following badges, the following information. If, if it's not one of us and they'll list who they are and it'll say like Red Cross, look for the following. Mind you, in their own language, of course, we had to have volunteers on the ground that were, or not we, but Hope for Justice did. And to hear how that was happening and the firsthand accounts of what's been going on, it's huge and it's still happening and the world seems to have forgotten and doesn't even care. Russia and Ukraine is still at war. It's bizarre. It's, it's, it's sort of fallen out of the headlines. You occasionally see headlines. You know, this week there were some spurts of headlines, but absolutely, you're correct. We've sort of moved on, but yet you can't move on from something that is so traumatic with people so injured and hurt and displaced and... You know, I, I think about this film coming at this time. How far before the invasion, you know, into Ukraine, did you guys start working on this movie? That's a great question because there was no strategy or or attempt in place in order to parallel some kind of simultaneous marketing angle. The film had already been shot and wrapped. It dealt with these true life stories where, especially the character that I play, he's in missionary work all over the world. It's, it was happenstance. And we and our distributor said, this is unbelievable. We may as well use it as part of the angle because it is based on a true story. So we knew nothing about it. The war hadn't started. This, had, this film had already long been wrapped and was in post-production. I mean, it's it's almost strangely, and I don't want to you know oversell or overpush this, but it's almost strangely prophetic in a way that the timing lined up. This happened with Life Mark too, right? Which is another film where the timing lined up after, and you wonder what God is doing in these circumstances because it brings attention to very real life things that have to do with major issues that are going on in the world right now. And so, in light of that, when people go and they watch Pursuit of Freedom, what is it that you're hoping they take away from the film? The message of hope and the message of faith that is in this film is pretty staggering. And I'll, I'll share briefly how I got involved with it because it, it is a thing of the Lord. 
My wife and daughter and I were on our way to Yellowstone and we were splitting driving shifts. I was sleeping in the back and my phone rings and there's this voice on the other side that says, hey, Stelio, I have an offer for you. What's your rate? And I was out of it, half asleep. And I said, I'm sorry, but who is this again? She goes, oh, it's it's that lady, Jean, we'd spoken once and her voice is she's so sweet. Her voice is cracking up on the phone. So and of course, my wife and daughter are like, you're great, Stelly. We can't even go on vacation. And here you are. You're at it again with work. We're supposed to not answer. So I read the script. I had to read it two or three times to actually be able to absorb the layer of the depths of what was going on. My character is very much a Peter, if you will. And ironically, the name of the character is Bedros, which in Armenian does mean Peter or the rock. And... I just knew that I had the skill set because you, as an actor, you read something and you want to make sure you can honor it. And sometimes that's easy because you connect with it immediately. Other times, if it's not the strength of your skill set or what's in your wheelhouse, okay, what's it going to take me to get there? And will I do it justice? And and maybe it's something I want to try because I haven't played it before. Not here. This man spoke to my heart immediately, the children's plight, knowing it was a true story, having done a little bit of research on the director before I'd spoken with him and requesting the conversation, it was a thing of the Lord. And I think it's not by mistake that, so I don't get my news. I don't watch Fox. I don't watch MSNBC. I get my news from the Bible. That's just where I get my news from because the Bible told us the earth was round when scientists told us it was flat. The Bible told us about dinosaurs when a lot of Christians believe they didn't exist. I get my wisdom from there. It is spiritual wisdom. And when you line up what's happening in the world with what's there biblically, the Bible already knows the story. The Lord already knows the end. So it's not by mistake that the Holy Spirit, the same way gave men the knowledge to write God's word and the Bible, is giving filmmakers, people who are walking faithfully and loyally, the ability to say, here's the message of hope and faith or whatever it might be that I want you to take out, adoption, I want you to take out into the world to be seen because it's lining up with my word and this is what's going to change hearts. And if we change one heart, just one, we've won. So, Yeah, that's incredible what you just said. And it it leads me because I, I think you're right. You've got movies, again, coming out at these very specific times when they're so needed and when those themes are needed to change hearts. And so I look at your journey, and one of the things getting to know you that's been so interesting is seeing your faith, which you just exhibited beautifully um, in Scripture, in truth, in the Lord. And I'm curious because you've done, I mean, you go to your IMDb page, you're a busy guy. You're, you've done a lot of projects. You continue to do a lot of projects. You've been in a lot. You've been in a lot of secular projects. You've been in faith-based projects, the chosen down the line. You know, when I look at that and I look at that career, I'm most interested in kind of going back to the faith aspect of how did you come to faith? Let's start there and then we'll talk about the journey into Hollywood. Sure. Um, And and thank you for that. So I'm South African. My parents were immigrants to South Africa. My father's side and then my mother's side, unfortunately, 17 years into marriage, Divorce hit the home. It was a broken home. A couple of years prior to that divorce, home life was horrendous. It was violent. It was um, very negative. And on top of that, my journey at school with friends was tumultuous, horribly inconsistent. I was not a happy child. I did have thoughts of just beginning thoughts of, I just want to jump out a window. I can't do this anymore. I'm always in trouble. Um very much a a victim mindset, but I truly was a victim. And then I'd heard of this thing called the body that was happening in Cape Town. It was a Christian thing. And I heard the message of Christ, which was, he loves you. He accepts you. You're important to him. You are worthy to him as long as you accept and believe his message. And I'd grown up in an Orthodox home where um, you prayed, they they were like, 2,700 different icons and saints, and it was just a little bit too much. Like I don't, it wasn't a real faith. It was it was legalism, and it was not biblically based. I didn't know that at the time. However, God puts that, he puts that little need in our heart. I gave my life to the Lord in 1984. I remember writing it in, in the Bible, in my Bible, I have given my life to the Lord. And then ironically, my father gave me that Bible years later through the divorce, 
my father, who was a wealthy man growing up, lost everything, became a believer. My mother became a believer. My sister, believer. My grandmother, God bless her, in her 70s, she got baptized. And wow, it was just incredible. I then um, immigrate to this country and blessed with a scholarship at the University of West Alabama. I struggle with a lot of things. I'm out in the desert and, and the Lord lets you wonder and come back to him. I get baptized at a Baptist church down there. I um, decide I'm going to pursue acting for a living. I actually, while I was in school, was doing theater down there. And at that point, getting even a stipend, making a little money and thought, I really like this. The head of the department said, you know, you should consider doing this for a living. We've not really had anybody with your passion come through here and you, you have the talent. So I moved to New York. Um, I don't know how long I should go on. Do you want me to talk about, about just... I'm fascinated just like everything because you just you presented a lot of amazing information about your background there. It's incredible to me that everybody came to faith out of that really difficult background, you know, and I think this is why it's so important. We have these moments of sharing that we have these Christian revivals and events and, you know, your story and so many other people's stories of showing up, hearing the message and having that light bulb go off and your life changes. But one of the things that popped in my head as you were talking about the, the acting piece that you wanted to go into acting, you know, a lot of people who go through struggles like what you described, especially with friendships and just the inconsistency, there's a lot of, you know, I'll use the word self-esteem. Not everybody loves that word, but self-esteem issues that come from that. So I'm really curious how you went into acting. That's a real, I mean, you're in front of people, you're talking in front of people. How did that sort of lead you still on this path to where you're going into entertainment? Almost by mistake, a lot of the prettiest girls at the University of West Alabama happened to be in the theater department. And I thought, okay, I think I want to, I think I want to pursue the theater department and then realized that things just came to me naturally in, in portraying certain roles. My instincts just felt right. Even then I, and I had no clue what I was doing. But even then, I knew from the director of the play, from the way I fell in love with playwrights and the eras of French New Wave and Italian neorealism in cinema, there was something very, and it is a self-esteem thing, there was something very seductive about having the power that you have when you're on stage to have four, five hundred, a 500, 1,000 people in the palm of your hand, being able to communicate something to them, a need that you have to share something with them. And it's very real and organic to you and seeing the response that comes from that. And I'm not talking about applause. I'm talking about the ability to get people to listen and get what, what your character's need is off your chest became almost addictive because I've, I'd never felt that kind of attention or, or power or interest in me my entire life. And I thought, okay, this is really interesting and I seem to have a knack for it. So that was the beginning of the transition. And look, I've compromised and made horrendous choices. You take, you take roles, and I'm speaking, you know, 30 something years forward now, because I've been, I've been doing this since the last supper. But you take, <laughs> you take roles for different reasons, right? You take a role and want to take a role, ideally, because you connect with a character. There's something that's desperate in that character, whether it's simple or complicated, that you need to connect with another character. So you take it for creative reasons, the, the script, the role, the director. You could take something for money reasons. You could take it for shooting location reasons. You could take it because you just need to get away. And over time, I've compromised working in genre I had no business being in, but excuse me, because you're in an industry where work begets work and it's good to constantly have product coming out. But with maturity as a believer, you realize, okay, here's the consequences for being in something that my daughter and younger generations are going to see from now. And I'm going to rack my head going, what in the world was I thinking? Or I've turned down stuff because maybe it was too Christian and felt more like a sermon rather than a film. And then you see it come out and it grosses $50 million. And then you hear people become believers because of it. 
and you go, okay, was my discernment right or wrong? And I, it's been difficult having these conversations with my pastor early on. There was someone in my church in New York at Harvest Christian Fellowship that said, why are you always playing? And this is, again, like 25 years ago. Why are you always playing killers and gangsters? How does that glorify God? And I said, but you're being very judgmental. You don't know what goes on behind the scenes. People come into my trailer. They see the Bible. They, they ask for prayer. They ask for encouragement. I went and spoke to my pastor, and he said, look, the Bible is the most R-rated book that's ever been written. If you're portraying a character that is sinful, and that sin is not glorified, and there's a consequence for his sin, that is between you and the Lord, and I can't speak for that, but I don't think I'd see something wrong with that. There's no such thing as a perfect person. And that has helped guide me a lot. Because it's redemptive. You know, I, I do think sometimes in the in the church, and I've worked in, in the field a little bit too, right? And we've talked, we've talked about this, you and I. You have a scenario where there's a story of a terrible person. And if you're going to tell the story of the terrible person changing and having some sort of redemption or paying the consequence for being terrible or doing something terrible, you need to show the story. And I think a lot of times we don't do that. We pull back from that. We're afraid to do that. And there's a difference between being gratuitous and doing it pointlessly and actually showing what that person's life was really like. Um, and so I think that's a tension that is still being worked out in a lot of faith-based films today. But I think it's getting better. I don't know what your assessment is of that. but You know, I'm not the best person to ask because I, again, was inspired and encouraged by the greatest era of film um, and the great eras that came before it. So I will look at the, you know, Kurosawa, the Karastamis, the Zhang Yamus, the Kustaritsas of the world, incredible filmmakers. Godard passed away yesterday. And to me, those were films that were mostly about characters. They weren't genre driven. They were about real people with real struggles. To me, The Bicycle Thieves is the greatest film that's ever been made by De Sica because it deals with the real conflict and struggle and it tugs at the strings of your heart. The father wanted to do something right for his child. They couldn't eat. They couldn't do everything. So he tried to steal a bicycle. He got caught, right? Um, so I think for me, with the way the faith-based and I hate even using that name because that, to me, it's not even a genre. Schindler's List was a, was a faith-based film to me. Okay, it might not have been Christian and it had an altar scene. Unbroken. The first Unbroken, you know, the, the first one, in a lot of ways, faith-based film. Angelina Jolie directed it, right? 100%. I think we have to get better. We have to just, with so many Christians, and I'll have this conversation with directors and end up walking away from or, or not taking the part, They they don't study the craft. Now, the, God is the greatest artist. And I try to inspire my child to think this way. Every time we're on a trip or in the car together, look at that sunset. No two sunsets and yep. sunrises are the same. They never have been. They never will be. The Lord is specific and he took care and he needed to take a day off for a reason. We should study our art because we're not trying to fish in the Sea of Galilee. We're trying to fish in all the oceans of the world. We were told to be fishers of men, not fishers of men in the choir, fishers of men, period. And um, I have so much respect for what the Irwin brothers have done in terms of improving films. I don't want to go to church to see a sermon. I want to go to church to be entertained. And I go to church to hear a message. I don't go to church to see a film and be entertained. I go to church to work on my character. So they've come a long way and they still have a long way to go. And I'm not referring to the Irwin brothers, but generally speaking. Yeah. And it's interesting too. you have films that you have others in that space that actually say, this is what we're doing. We are actually preaching to the church and they're, they're saying like, this is our piece and we're doing that intentionally. That's what we want to do. I actually understand that. If you're saying this is what you want to do and that's what you're going after, I think it becomes muddier when it's like we're putting this content out and we want everybody to love it, but it feels like a sermon, right? If you're intending to make a sermon, that's one thing. That's fine. You're intending to make a sermon for the church. I'm actually okay with that, but I want to know that. I want to understand that. And so I think we're seeing we're seeing that develop still. And like you said, there's a long way to go. It's moving. Now, as we sort of round out to the end here, one of the things I like to ask people, and I definitely want to have you back because there's so much more to talk about, but you know, I look at I look at you and what you're doing. You're busy. You're filming a lot. 
you've done a lot. At the end of the day, you mentioned, yeah, you've made mistakes here or there. You've done projects maybe you shouldn't have. But, but when you look back at your life, okay, and years to come, and you look back at your legacy, what do you want that legacy to be? You know, it's interesting. A few people have asked that question. And I think that you mentioned the word self-esteem. Um, I would parallel it this way. The same way there are films that are made for both believers and non-believers, because the Bible is written that way. Most of the New Testament is for believers. I, I think the word legacy is very selfish. I think that my, my pastor had encouraged us a few years ago, write down the reason for which you think you were created, the gifts you have, the purpose for your life. And I already knew what it was. It had been spoken into my life, but I already knew it. It was to be able to reach people in addition to the obvious, which is being the husband I need to be and the father I need to be and the believer I need to be, reaching people that the church cannot because I don't put my faith in people's faces. I That's just not me. I don't um, necessarily go out of my way. I will, I will pray and ask for wisdom. And on every project, the Lord will bring someone. And they're in touch. They'll ask for prayer. Some of them have come to know the Lord. But my the Lord wanted to give me certain gifts to be able to share the gospel with people the typical church cannot. So if I'm on set someone happens to see me pray before I eat. They walk into my trailer. There's a Bible there. They ask what drives me, how I'm working so much. It allows me to point to the Christ. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that that way. And so you are, you believe this, this, and this. And I go, yeah. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about, because this sounds interesting. Could you tell me a little bit more about your your Bible study et cetera, or your church? Again, I think the le the word legacy is vanity because I think the legacy is Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. To me, and I just broke down crying with tears of joy when my pastor said this a few weeks ago, the Word is Christ. That is the Word. And if we can point to Him, that is the legacy. All the stuff about nominations or awards or box office or that doesn't go anywhere. Uh, that stays here. You don't take it with you. Your spirit doesn't carry it. But there are rewards in heaven for things we do that please our Father that we will be acknowledged for. So I think the legacy has to lean into that, not something of self. Pointing to him. Now, I think that's, that is incredibly powerful. And I think the more we get to a place, no matter where we are, and I think it's important to emphasize no matter where people who are watching or listening are, that God will use and can use you no matter where you are, no matter what industry it is, no matter what part of life. Maybe you're not working at all. Maybe you're, you know, keeping your house afloat. You're, you know, the, you're doing everything, running the kids everywhere, that you have a purpose in a place wherever you are. And I think once we learn to kind of put ourselves, you know, not before God, but after God and to follow him, yes. that I agree with you on that word legacy. So I love that. I love that response. It's about pointing back to him. And listen, I want to thank you for taking the time today. You gave me a lot of time telling your story, talking about the film, and people can go out and watch the film in theaters. It's Pursuit of Freedom. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Billy, asking such great questions. Look forward to visiting with you again. Appreciate you. Thank you.